Welcome to uh, um, day two of Science Police Parliament. Um, uh, and as you know, throughout the day, people will be coming and going with uh, various um, scheduled meetings and rescheduled meetings and uh, completely unexpected meetings and so on, which is part of the uh, fun of the day. Um, we are really privileged um, this morning to have uh, Ian Chubb, uh, uh, the immediate, of course, past Chief Scientist of Australia, um, former Vice Chancellor of ANU, and a long Azure Arm um, list of uh, other credits. I think um, uh, Ian is uh, widely acknowledged to have played a very major part in, in bringing um, science uh, uh, really to the front of the agenda um, in Australia and uh, um, it was a bit of a pleasure to watch the different um, parties slugging it out on the um, uh, the rostrum last night trying to out outdo each other with with, with their um, st statements of support for uh, uh, science and innovation and a lot of the credit for that has to go to Ian's very uh, careful work over a long period in very challenging circumstances and I'd like to record that. Um, uh, this morning Ian is, is uh, dressed down for a conversation which is really great uh, and um, uh, our redoubtable CEO um, Katrina Jackson is going to lead him who knows where in conversation. Professor Ian Chubb finished his stint as Chief Scientist for Australia just over a month ago, month ago and has been, as Jim has pointed out, one of the most influential scientists and academic leaders in Australia for as long as I can recall and I'm sure the same goes for all of you. He spent 10 years as Vice-Chancellor of the Australian National University. I think that's almost deadly, a decade. Survived a decade <laughs> at the Australian National University and before that Flinders University. Uh, before that again he was chair of the Commonwealth Government's peak advisory body on higher education, the Higher Education Council in the 1990s and was a feared figure. Is that fair Ian? No. <laughs> uh, before that he was a very vocal president of what was then the AVCC, the Australian Vice-Chancellor's Committee. In the 1970s, Ian undertook a series of fellowships at Oxford doing research on neuroscience and later at the University of Ghent, Belgium. We could read Ian Chubb's CV all day, but let's cut to the chase and actually hear from the man himself. I am enormously pleased that Ian could join us uh, today as a gentleman of leisure. You don't have to do these things anymore, so welcome very much, Ian. Thanks, Katrina. So you know what we're doing here today. Um, you probably more than anyone who's got anything to do with science in this country probably knows more about politics. I'm wondering if you can cast your mind way, way, way back to the first meeting you had with a parliamentarian. Well, I can. And I, do you I, wish to? I, I, and I wondered what I was doing there. Um, I think the uh, lights went out the minute I walked in the door. And I don't know whether that was a reflection on me or the person whose lights went out, but... Um, uh, I think they were the days when uh, we didn't do it very much. We certainly did it, uh, uh, well, we, did, we hardly did it at all, meet with politicians and so on, except for a particular purpose, which was uh, quite specifically designed to get money out of them in some way or other. And of course, uh, what you soon come to realise is that they've got uh, people coming through their door asking for more money. Uh, probably every hour of the day when they're not in the chamber and, and, and during sitting weeks. And, um, and you have to approach it differently. And I guess that's what I learned quite early on, just to go in and say, give us more money. And when they say, why? And you say, because we could spend it. And they, you, they say, why? And you say, because we don't get enough. So what do you want more money? Doesn't work. Never has. Um, as far as I can see, never will. So you've got to learn. Okay. You've got to take a more subtle approach. Okay, so it's like demanding it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering. So, so how do you go about it if you're not walking in there saying, "Look, we are doing amazing things." So, for heaven's sake, would you just, you know, cough up the the cabbage? What do you do? Well, I think I think it's the importance issue and the significance issue and the deeply cultural issue that has really got to be the focus. And it does mean bringing the Australian community along with you. I think it's. It's too easy to think that because you have what you might think of as a good meeting uh, with a politician that somehow things have improved from that meeting. 
Um, and, uh, and that's not how it works. I mean, most of the politicians keep their... I know there's only one poll that counts. We all know that, I presume. Senator Carr, he's probably going to be here late. Um, the, uh, but they'll all tell you there's only one poll that counts, and that's election day. But the reality is they keep their finger very tightly on the pulse of what the community is thinking and, and increasingly respond to that. So, so it's, it's, it's really working all the angles. One of them is the political angle and not letting up on it. Today is a spike, or the, 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 this process is a spike. Most of the people you will deal with are well-intentioned. I, I haven't, I've met very, very few people who go into politics without good intentions. Uh, sometimes that changes later, but they go in with good intentions. They're extraordinarily busy. Um, they've got people knocking on their door all the time wanting something, um, and they've got to prioritise. So walk in the door, have a good meeting, sure. But next week there's got to be a follow-up and the week after that. So it's a question of lifting the threshold of understanding to a level where it's there all the time and not a series of spikes that, that pop up because, you know, gravitational waves. Gravitational waves was really good. It got really good press for two days. And now people say we're excited by it, but the people who say we're excited by it don't actually know what it means. So, so we've got to tell the public why it's important that all that money and all those people devoted their time to doing that for these reasons, as well as the fundamental understanding of how the universe might, or, or give insights into how the universe might work or be, have been formed or whatever uh, comes out of it, or the technology that we have to invent in order to be able to do that extraordinary piece of work. So all of those need to be explained much more broadly, but include the political process, uh, but not exclusive to the political process. Yeah. Um, one of the, the things I find interesting when our delegates come back from meetings, often people will look at me quite surprised and say, gee, they listened to me. They were really nice. Uh, I think that goes to the point you've just made. Uh, a good meeting is, is not enough. And most parliamentarians, frankly, part of their job, especially if they're members of the House, of, of, if they're a member of the House, they have to get people to vote for them, so of course they're nice. Of course, they're going to be pleasant to you. If, if people are thinking about, we've had lots of discussion yesterday about, about follow-up, about making sure you keep in contact, making sure you supply the information they ask for. Is there anything else you'd recommend to keep that sort of virtuous cycle going? Uh, no, but I would do it um, uh, so regularly that you might become bored by it, but it's important. Um, it, it is true that you will have good meetings with uh, these people in lots of ways. It's important for them and for you that it is. But the number of people I've seen go out of a politician's office, or indeed sometimes even out of my office, and you hear them say, well, that was a really good meeting, and you're beginning to think about who's coming in now. And they're doing that too, because there will be a string of people who have got issues for them that they want to raise with them and expect some help and assistance or whatever. So it's really a question of maintaining that level of activity. Um, you know, not on two intense days like this or intense days like this, but, but regularly through the course of the year and interacting with the local community as well. And I think that's uh, very important. We've got to work hard at it because the, the media is not particularly sympathetic except to something that they can label as breakthrough. Um, and I, I understand why they do that and I'm a critical of them for doing that. But it just means that it's, there's, there's just that bit um, more work that has to be done to make sure that we maintain the momentum that builds up or starts on a day or a period like this. Um, I'll go to questions in about 10 minutes' time, but I want to ask you whether you ever thought about going into politics yourself. <laughs> no. <laughs> why, why not? Well, You're good I'm, at it. I'm not idealistic enough. <laughs> they, uh, I don't know who do that to themselves, actually. Mind you. I suppose if you lived in Canberra, it would be all right, but, um, but I, I just think that it's a terribly hard life. I don't, I don't think... So, so let me be brutally frank. There are a whole bunch of um, people whose views I would respect even if I disagree with the substance, and, but I know why they would hold those views. There are a small number of people who I, who I just think are beyond the pale, but relatively small number. Um, uh, and, and I don't think that we give the overwhelming bulk of them the respect that we, 
that they deserve in order to get what we need out of the political process, as, or as much out of the political process as we could. And I probably would say that in a different way, but it's similar to the way in which we regard teachers. We don't give them the esteem that we should give them. We don't give the profession the esteem that we should give it because of its central importance to the future of the country. And, and so there are going to be people who will go in there or who will choose not to go in there. I'm not including myself in this, but, but in, would choose not to go in there simply because it seemed to be one of the last things you would want to do. And yet most of the people that you'll meet today, as I said, go in with very honourable intentions and work very hard, extremely hard in many respects, it, most, overwhelming majority of them, work very hard to do what they think is the right thing. I would think that some of what they think is the right thing is not the right thing, mm -hmm. but that's a democracy. Um, but but I, I don't doubt their intention most of the time. Increasing the cynicism about politics makes things harder for, for everyone, really, doesn't it? Well, it does, and I mean, it's getting worse by the day, I think. I mean, you, you look at the news this morning, you look at what's happening in the United States, you. You look at what's happening in parts of Europe and so on, and it's, there's a there's now it seems to me to be a a, a deeply embedded cynicism, and uh, and and you know as the as the media would say, certainly with respect to America, then the the American community wants change, but why you would want any change, including horrible change, is uh, is is quite another matter. And, and I guess that's where you see politics drifting. Um, I'm keen to have a conversation with you about the approach you took to the office of a chief scientist. It's, it's a strange office, the chief scientist. It seems to be sort of different depending on who takes, who takes the job. Yeah. Can you give me an idea of, of the thinking as you approach the job and, and how, you, how you wanted to do it and put your stamp on it? Well, I think it's true, Katrina, that um, each chief scientist, uh, I, I forget which number I was, 10 or something, 11 or 12 or something. Um, each one has done it in their own way. Um, there was a block in the middle who were part-time, and I think it's, uh, uh, to me, it's inconceivable that you could do the job part-time. Um, it, it certainly, Julia, Julia Gillard said to me, this will be an easy transition to retirement, Ian, because I just left a and <laughs> Yeah, well, I should have known myself better, but uh, I uh, should also have known that it wasn't <coughs> going to be that, and it wasn't. And now I'm in transition to retirement, as you can tell by my cladding. I'm, I'm, it's, uh, I did have a shave this morning, although one of the things that I used to hate doing was having to shave every day, except Saturday, and, uh, and wear a suit every day. So here I am, you know, a retired gentleman. I should add that some people dispute the fact that I'm retired. Nobody yet has disputed <laughs> the fact that I'm a gentleman, except you got near it when uh, you said there was a fear factor. Um, they... Uh, um, so I think, what was your question? The question, <laughs> what was the question, guys? So approach to the Office of Chief Scientist, oh, yeah. how did you want to make it yours? Oh, well, I wanted to do what I thought was right and where I thought the big gaps were. I said to um, Kim Carr, who was the minister, and Julia Gillard at the time, that, that there is no point doing a job like that if you don't have influence. Um, I mean, just to swan around saying, you know, here's my business card and it says Chief Scientist, what's the point of that? If you, if you can't use that to have some influence on the directions that, that important issues are taking. I thought that, um, that uh, from my own background, but also from what I learnt in the first few months of being Chief Scientist, that there were a lot of things that we had to do better in Australia. And I, I don't get into this self-delusionary model that, you know, we're so good at everything um, that uh, all, all, you know, all we're bad at is innovation. Well, actually... It, it, the whole thing should come together in a much more cohesive way. And I tried to say, well, sure, our best are very good. There is no question about that. Our average is not so good. And we should recognise that and then not go around saying, oh, we punch above our weight. What a ridiculous expression. Um, I remember I used yeah. that in a press release once and he was on the phone. I, I think it was 30 seconds after it went out. Yeah, well, it, it's meaningless because, you know, as, as I've also said that there are 190 plus nations in the United Nations, and the OECD has uh, declared that 145 of them are, are, are eligible for foreign aid. So if we aren't in the top 45 or something, then then we're, we're, what on earth would be happening? So it's a really question of being realistic about it. And I tried to be, on the one hand, 
uh, very supportive, on the other hand, realistic, um, and to build a, a set of relationships that, that would endure beyond the time that um, I've been in the job. I'll ask you more about your approach, but what do you think of the UK system where they have a whole bunch of chief scientists to hold across a whole bunch of portfolios? Would that work here? Is it viable? Is it you know, politically possible? Well, I think you can make anything work here if you want to, uh, and I think they're, they're, they're trying hard to make it work, and from the outside it looks very good. I know some people who are on the inside and, uh, and they would question some aspects of it, like perhaps I would. Um, we, we, have, uh, we haven't adopted that approach uh, in Australia, it's perhaps partly because we're a bit smaller, partly because the, of the, the, the way in which we're structured. Um, but, uh, but it's also true that embedded within most of the relevant departments there is somebody that you could label as being the, 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 the local scientific guru, so in agriculture, and Antarctic division, um, you've got agency heads and so on. So it, it, we do have uh, people in places where you can bring them together and, uh, and have a talk about things, and we used to do that on a on a intermittent basis. Mm -hmm. I'll go to questions after this one. Can I just make sure someone has microphones in the room so we're ready to go to questions? And if someone doesn't have microphones in the room, can someone stick their head out and make sure someone comes in with mics? Thank you very much, message received. Um, can I ask you about a bit more intimate detail about how you approach the job of, of being chief scientist? It seemed to me through at least the last, well, through the whole period, that you went about building an evidence base and doing a lot of policy work, which in some interpretations could be seen to be the work of government. There was a fair bit of hiatus going on at that time, so there wasn't a lot going on in science policy inside the government. And what ended up happening is there was a significant raft of materials ready so when the government was ready to go, they could go really quickly. Have I got that completely wrong? Uh, no, not completely. I think, I think that um, uh, there were things that... So, for example, I think that I um, had reinforced, maybe I already knew it, but um, when I went in and had a look and I saw that the R&D budget from the Australian government was spread over 150 separate programs, some of which were small. 150? Well, in, in total. So that, that's an ungenerous... It's an accurate but ungenerous view of it because... Um, when you took out all the small ones, it came down to about 45. But 45 separate programs uh, across 14 portfolios uh, where any real integration actually meant people had to be willing to do it. There was no, no um, organisation to facilitate that. It just seemed to me to be running the risk of us not being able to achieve what we could achieve, even with the same expenditure. So, so I argued that we had to take a much more whole of government approach to that. When I, when I looked around the world, that's what I saw. I saw nearly every country that we would compare and contrast our world, ourselves with, including some that on all the performance metric performed better than we did. They all had national strategies. They all had, whether they were a federation or not, they had national strategies. They had national policies. They had, they had um, you know, commitments to long-term investments and so on which is not something that we did routinely. And we've had some good programs over the past decades, but they've tended to be programs with particular purpose. Um, so, for example, as I argued with the government, both um, when Senator Carr was minister and also after him, uh, and the different, you know, there have been four prime ministers since I was in the job. And, uh, you go through I, them. I, I could tell you some personality stories, yeah. Um, the, morning uh, tea, morning tea. <laughs> they, uh, um, but but they all, they all have their views on things like this, and the, the real question was was how did you how did you bring some coherence to it? Well, I thought that the best way to do it was to to argue first for a whole of government approach, but then to say that that's got to be the back of the off the back of a good strategy. So I don't think there's a, a, any point in talking about innovation unless we're talking about education too. There's no point talking about innovation unless we're playing the talking about the role that science would play in innovation, but there's no point presuming and pretending that all of innovation or all of science supports innovation. Science is science and the knowledge that we gain by prosecuting good science will be sitting there waiting for people to come along with good ideas and putting six bits together and making something that people want to buy. 
this, this idea that there's some linear relationship between what that person up there does and a commercial product is insane. Um, it, it doesn't work like that, but it does work by, by supporting great science and reminding scientists that there is some obligation to do really good work, making it public um, and making it available to people who have different skill sets from them often. Who will say, yes, we put, and we build one of these. <coughs> Nobody sat down and said, we've got a completely clean whiteboard here, I'm going to build a smartphone. What they did was put half a dozen, or 16 I think it was, different patents together, or some large number of different patents together, and they produced this thing, which half of us now aren't. <coughs> and, um, and I think that, that that link is important, so linking them, um, encouraging each to talk to each other in ways that we've never had before, on a scale that we've never achieved before, sitting inside a long-term strategic direction and suite of policies, and coherence drawn from a whole-of-government approach is what I tried to do. And I think that um, uh, we've taken some good steps in that direction. OK, I'll take questions but after this, this last one, because I want to ask Anne about that good direction. People ready with questions? You're all thrusting, brilliant, sensational. Um, uh, so the National Innovation and Science Agenda, get it out. Um, uh, there, uh, tell us what, what you think. Tell us whether that was the culmination, whether it's, how do you feel about it? Well, I don't think it's culmination. I think it's a, a, it's a serious step along the right direction. And there were some things in there that I didn't expect. I mean, as I was just saying, I argued for a long time for a whole of government approach. What I didn't expect was the government to come up with a cabinet committee for innovation and science. That's at a level <clears throat> higher than I'd anticipated we would get to. So, so there, there are... People might need a bit more explanation of why that's important. Well, the Prime Minister will chair it and the Cabinet Ministers will be present and it, it, it puts it on a level with the National Security Committee, the Expenditure Review Committee. I mean, it's just about as high up the tree as you can get for these sorts of things and I thought that that was a good... Uh, you know, in principle, that's a very good thing to do. Of course, it's got to work, but, um, but in principle, it was a very good thing to do. Um, and I agreed with an, an, a number of the significant changes. I agreed with the fact that alongside that, released in uh, mid-December, uh, mid but got lost in the Christmas rush, um, was uh, the federal and state and territory ministers signed off on a national STEM strategy for schools. I mean, if you look at that document, that's a big step forward. So you put these various things together, and, and, and I think... Yeah, the, 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 the weight of it is, is greater than the sum of the parts, if I can put it that way. Yeah, indeed. On the other hand, what is the strategy for science in the country? What is our 10 to 15 year plan for science in the country? Uh, do, we, do we have one of those? And I don't think we do yet. We have some of the, some of the, we've got a path laid out. We've got some steps that we know that we can take and should take. But at the end of the day, I would want to know what is how, 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 what do we think about the the position of physics in 2025, or maths, or chemistry, or whatever it might be. How are we going to do that? And and the academy pulls out these decadal plans, which are the result of good work by serious people, but somehow they've got to be put together by in a way or 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 massaged because. The, you know, academies inevitably will have stuff in there that a government couldn't necessarily accept, depending on the circumstances and the time, perhaps. But but the real question is, um, how do we how do we develop a cohesive, comprehensive plan uh, for the future of science in the country, and give indications of the support for science in the country? What are we going to do? I, I mean, I know that there's a school of thought that says 18 year old. To, uh, you know, your children um, make better decisions than you can make. <clears throat> These are usually by people who believe in a free market that will solve all problems. I've never seen a free market operate in the higher education system. I, and I don't actually see it in countries like America, the UK, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, whatever. I don't see it operating there. I see a proper relationship, a proper relationship between government researchers, scientists, <clears throat> and um, business and industry embracing the community as a whole. And, and uh, there will be an interview that comes out with me from me 
by me, given by me, fairly soon. And I don't know what headline they'll run because you never trust the headline writers. But the um, but the gist of the story is that it takes three to tango, and it does. You've got to get the government and the the researching community, uh, which in our case is very largely universities, but not exclusively, obviously, but sixty odd percent in universities. You've got to get get all of the research community, the government, uh, and business working together w within a set of values that the community creates for us. You know, we can't do things. Tony Blair, I'm so fond of quoting this that that uh, uh, if he got a royalty for every um, time I quoted, he'd be even richer. But um, you know, he said science lets us do more, but it doesn't tell us whether doing more is right or wrong. And there is a profound message in that. That means that means getting to the community, working within a suite of community mores, informing them, bringing them with you, doing all of those sorts of things. So you put it all together, and we're cooking with high calorific, um, sustainable energy. We'll go to questions. Do we have one in the front here? We do. Mike in the middle, please. If you could just say who you are and stand up would be great. Luke Barrett, CSIRO. Um, given the, the, the new innovation agenda, can you comment on getting the balance right between basic research, um, commercially focused research and public good research going forward? Um, well, I, I, uh, so this answer probably won't be much use to you, but because uh, uh, I don't know what the balance should be if you're thinking in terms of you know proportionate terms or whatever. Um, but I am thinking that, uh, that in Australia we have to make sure that we overtly support all three, or, or, or all elements, all, all elements of the research, full research spectrum. It would be inconceivable, in my view, for us only to support applied research. Um, we we have to be participating in the generation of knowledge through research. We have to be inside the tent. And again, going back in uh, um, stuff that I've said and talked about before, but, but before 1946, Australia was essentially a mendicant country. We, we in, in, these, in this context, we, we did very little research. Academics who did research in our universities were basically doing it because they liked it. Um, we had a NH and MRC, which was pretty small. Most of the money that went into universities was used in the, from the 50s onwards was used to support research and the research councils topped up rather than play the central role they do now. So we've emerged from a place where in 1946 no universities were expected to do research and CSIRO was small in those days. Um, and no universities were expected to do research to a point now where all universities are expected to do research to be called a university. Um, the the post-war reconstruction led to the establishment of ANU specifically to bring research into the country. And I don't think that we could ever, ever want to go back to the point where we denied our, our essential contribution to the generation of knowledge through the research that we do. What we've never done well, and I think I'd say this without any qualification, we have never done well is to take the expertise that's built up through doing that research and use it with people who have sometimes, as I said earlier, different skill sets to turn it into goods and services and products that people want to buy. And somehow we've always downplayed that side of it. With When I was a young researcher, you never thought of doing that because somehow it was lesser. So we have a deeply cultural problem. We've compartmentalised these things um, we've made it difficult for people whose real genius would be in building products and better services. We've somehow denied that that's legitimate, or as legitimate as just somebody who writes a research grant, gets a research grant, publishes a paper, that if you believe the statistical data has a 50% chance of never being cited by anybody. Uh, and that somehow, traditionally in our universities, was always seen to be more important and somebody who solved a problem for BHP. And I don't think that's sensible. So, so the only way we can do it, I think, is not to argue for a balance in, in terms of proportion, but to argue that we need the full spectrum of research to be supported overtly and recognised overtly as being important contributions to the future of the country and its role in the world. Because by doing this, 
we get a ticket to the tent where the big tables are and the big decisions are being made. If we're sitting outside the tent saying, we'll wait for you to do it, then we're outside the tent. So we've just got to behave differently. Ian, I would love to take 5,000 questions and continue the conversation for the next hour, but as you can see, we have a Shadow Minister bearing down on us, not a position one wants to be in. Um, that for a retired gentleman, you are outlining a program of work for all of us, which is substantial. Are you going to tell us what you're going to do next? <coughs> Retirement, um, you know, really? Well, um, I'm, no, I'm just going to go home after this and sit in the hammock and sip quite a mullen rum. Can we all come? <laughs> That's why I'm dressed for it. I mean, I, I, otherwise I'd have worn a suit or a, you know, elaborate attire like the Shadow Minister. I, I, um, I uh, no, no, I'm, well, I don't know the answer to that, Katrina. I, I don't drink rum till the sun goes down, but the, um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, I mean I, I'm not anxious to do anything full time, of course. I'm a, an old man, but I, um, but I don't want to stop completely. Um, but it just depends on how many people in this room can now afford my fees and charges. So, <laughs> this, this is done at mates' rates, I should tell you. But, uh, Thank you so much, Ian. We'd love you to stay for um, uh, morning tea if oh, you'd like I'll to. And, to the, well, yeah, I'm hoping the, you'll um, stay heckle, ask questions, all, will, all sorts, all sorts. Thank you very much. Please Thank join you. me in welcoming Ian Sharp. <laughs>